Chapel Tree Prelim Round 3. We've had two outstanding presentation uh, rounds up till now. And uh, this also, uh, I'm sure, will be very, very interesting and inspiring for uh, all of us. Uh, we will uh, hopefully stick to time and uh, so that we start the proceedings on time. Now we will have Dr. Megha Nair, who will be talking on iVerta, uh, her presentation, please. Good morning, everybody. I'll be presenting a video on the iVerta. It's an innovation that we have made in Arvindai Hospital. Okay, I'll be starting my video. Eye water. Eversion of eyelids has been a skill-based technique performed by ophthalmologists using their hands. Often it has been proven to be a challenge in situations such as patients with no eyelashes or madrosis, those with deep sockets in uncooperative patients, especially children, and in infective conditions with copious amount of discharge. But the risk of spread of infections through contact during COVID-19 pandemic raised this challenge to a higher level. It was time to come up with a better idea to evert the eyelids without touching. Eversion of eyelids using fingers occurs by combination of two forces, a pulling force by fingers on the eyelashes and a pushing force by the fingers on the upper tarsus. So, we thought of recreating these forces without using fingers. Many models were tried. Finally, they were narrowed down to a very simple instrument made of only two materials. One, a double-sided tape and second, an ice cream stick. The ice cream stick was cut at one end to a length of 3.5 cm and a breadth of 6 mm so that it fit just below the upper border of the upper tarsal plate. To the cut end, a double-sided tape of length 3.5 cm and breadth 5 mm were stuck to. The following video demonstrates the use of eye water. The eye water can be used in routine OPD examination. It has a universal usage in all patients including adults, older and pediatric age groups. It can be manipulated to see the area of interest. Also, double eversion can be tried using this instrument. A similar model was created using 3D printer using polylactic acid. The eye water can be reused by sticking another double tape over it after sterilizing it. Its uses include to examine the upper tarsal conjunctiva and superior fornix, to remove the foreign body in the upper tarsal conjunctiva, saline wash in chemical injuries, to examine swellings of eyelid like internal hodiolum and collagen, to examine lid pathologies. Helps avoid transmission of infections between doctors and patients easily sterilized, very cost-effective and economical. Thank you, Dr. Mega. Uh, you're done. Uh, Thank okay. you, Dr. Mega. That's a that's a very excellent idea, but a very simple yes, idea at that. And uh, how did you think of doing this? Because this is one of the challenge that we all have in all the when you are examining the outpatient clinics. Yes, but my question is, does it the double-sided tape? Yes. One sticking to the eyelashes or eyebrows when you do it, and then the problem the patients having any pain or any of that sort. Uh, so, uh, till now, when we have tried with patients, it has not stuck to the eyebrows or the eyelashes. It has an adhesiveness to the skin, but uh, it is not painful though. It is also not sticky to the skin, it just sticks to the, uh, the, so the eyelashes. the eyelashes and eyebrows, uh, it's the, not, no it, patient has complained till now so about far, it. So. What about, you also mentioned that it, it works on even on patients with hardiolum and all that. Won't it be painful for the patient when you stick this and try to avert it? 
Yes, sir. I, uh, so it'll be better for a calasion rather than on a hordeolum. Sure. It'll be more tent. If it's yeah. a hordeolum, it's yeah. tender. It's better not to use it. I think it's an excellent idea, but a very, very simple. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. In older patients with yes, lid laxity, with yes, the sir. skin laxity or with the dermatocalysis, yes, do you find any difficulty in sticking of the tape because the skin is very lax? Tape? Yes, sir. it is a bit difficult to do it on older patients with skin laxity, especially because the uh, the uh, the double-sided tape actually is uh, loosely attached to the skin actually. So first the skin everts and then the lid everts. So it's a bit difficult. We have to work In more on patients. it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you uh, Dr. Megha, you can collect your certificate from okay, Dr. Sir. Kim Ram. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll next request Dr. John Davis to please come. He has two presentations. Uh, we can have them. Uh, uh, they will have them back to back. So, uh, audiovisual team, please help in change of the laptop. May I start, sir? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So. This invention is a pocket fundoscope, which is a 3D printed foldable ultra, ultra portable smartphone fundus camera. I'm Dr. John Davis Zakara from Western Eye Hospital, Kochi, and also <coughs> working at Chaitanya Eye Hospital, Kochi. So uh, the author has uh, a provisional patent for this invention and has commercial and financial interest in this device. That's a financial disclosure. We all know about the evo evolution of computers, starting from Abacus to the big computers, to the desktop, laptops, then the tab, smartphone, and now the smart watches. But there is also an evolution of fundus photography. First, there were the large, poor quality fundus imaging devices, which did not give much uh, clarity. Then they slowly became better, but then uh, they were still very large devices and very expensive. Then we have the current generation of desktop fundus cameras, the smaller ones, and also the portable ones, which are uh, handheld portable ones. And then we also had a lot of smartphone-based devices. We have the uh, smartphone-based commercial ones. We have also the non-mediatic uh, smartphone-based commercial ones, and also the um, uh, non-mediatic is expensive. Mediatic, low-cost smartphone-based uh, fundus cameras with a lens. So there's also 3D printed ones. These are a few of the 3D printed ones. This is the uh, set of 3D printed fundus cameras. So what I thought was, let's go to the next level, which is foldable fundoscope, which is foldable, fits in your pocket. It is fast to unfold and it takes fundus photos. So how did I go about doing this? I first uh, got the concept of getting a very ultra portable one which can fit in your pocket because that seems to be the last mile. Even after making it portable, people tend to not use it because it's difficult to carry around. So I designed it using CAD. I learned CAD, drew the drawings myself, used 3D printing, selected the better designs, the ones which work better, and finally ended up with this. So this is a free CAD software. With that, I made the device, I made it foldable so that it folds onto itself. And then this is the 3D printed one. This is the actual physical device which works. This has a lens, which is a 20 diopter lens, which is based on the same principle as all the other smartphone based fundus cameras. It has a lens case. So this is unique that it protects the lens and it closes and acts as a lens case. You can put it in your pocket, keep the lens safely. You don't have to touch the lens or damage the lens at any point. There is a folding joint and this folds into this lens case. And then there is an attachment for the phone and the phone attaches here. And many of you will be familiar with the smartphone fundus photographs. It depends on the skill of the examiner as well as the quality of the camera. It needs mediasis. If the patient's pupil is not dilated, it's difficult to take. So if you uh, if you align it correctly with the correct um, phone clarity, you can get very good photographs such as this. So you can get photographs 
and you can use this phone software itself to draw a circle around it and make it a fundus photograph like a from a commercial fundus camera so these are some of the photographs taken with this and it takes photographs similar to the desktop fundus cam this is from a zeiss desktop fundus camera the area is less but it gives decent quality so it is a low cost ultra portable smartphone fundus camera perfect for all cost conscious ophthalmologists postgraduate students and fellows can be used for patients on bedside referral also unlike the other expensive ones it acts as a case for the 20 diopter lens as well and uh, i have a patent in process thanks to dr suen bhattacharya dr ashish sharma dr biju raju for guiding me on that future plans is worldwide uh, sales manufacturing sales thank you thank you dr john davis uh, John, again, uh, another addition from your galaxy of uh, innovations. Yeah. You're kind of becoming the Edison of ophthalmology. So uh, very nice uh, creation and looks very simple also. Also, I mean, I, I understand it must have been difficult doing this. I just want to know, the, at the end of the day, uh, the quality of the images that you've got, A, how dependent is it on the phone and the, the camera of the phone that you use? B, have you kind of uh, validated it against the other existing smartphone? Because now, you know, there is with every passing month, there seems to be more and more of these coming in. So uh, what is your USB? How, do, how, how, how is it going to be a better addition to what we have? So the quality of the fundus photos with this depends on the camera. Yes. But most of the smartphone cameras at this point of time are good enough or even better than uh, what is required because you cannot buy a phone without a decent camera nowadays and this is exactly the same principle as all the other smartphone fundus cameras so if you have a smartphone fundus camera give a decent picture this gives you the exact same picture the only difference is that it is ultra portable the other ones are this size this it folds into your pocket Okay. Principle is exactly the same. Principle is the same. And uh, does this have artifacts that are less the same or more? So others? right now, uh, this is in the patent process. I have some ideas to reduce the uh, artifacts, the glare from the illumination, which I cannot disclose right now. It is not there in this, but it is in the patent process. It will reduce the glare uh, based on some of the principles other smartphone funders, camera innovators have taught me. Okay, good. Congratulations and uh, best of luck for your patent. Thank you, yes. sir. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. So this is with a flash from the phone. Um, this gives you glare. If, uh, if you look at the images, you can see yeah, the no, glare. Yeah, right. there, is glare is there is some amount of reflection from the uh, flash but maybe could if you, you get the this screen, is the please. glare audio visual could you get the but if you uh, if you can change the illumination system which is what i am planning you can avoid the glare that will come in the next version of this that's in process yes ma'am you mean an additional illumination uh, system or is it in the phone that you are going to Additional illumination systems. Also, can you change the lenses? Like, can you use only? Yes, sir. You can change the lenses. Okay. This, even though it is, it looks like it is uh, like this, but it is a replaceable lens. You can remove the lens, replace it with uh, any other lens, and in fact, I can make attachments to make it fit a 28 diopter lens, which uh, ROP uh, is it's good for ROP. So you can change the lens size with the changing the adapter here. This is just an adapter which you pull out and put back in. Good idea. Thank you, uh, Dr. John. Uh, can you go on to your next presentation? Sure. Sir. Which is uh, designing and making 3D printed glaucoma drainage devices. So the next one is a video. It's a video followed by I'll just explain what it is also. Welcome Dr. Manchu, uh, chairperson for this session. HDMI audio.
designing and 3D printing novel glaucoma drainage devices. Dr. John Davis Akra, Dr. Narayan Balakrishnan and Dr. Anju Kuriyaku. The authors have no financial interest in this presentation. I'm Dr. Narayan Balakrishnan and I am a practicing glaucoma consultant. My colleague, Dr. John Davis and I have attempted to make an innovative glaucoma drainage device that can be implanted and analyzed to practice implantation of this device and help in future implantation of glaucoma drainage devices in everyday practice. The implantation of glaucoma drainage devices very difficult and require a long learning curve, also very expensive. And hence, it deters young ophthalmologists from buying them, practicing them, and then using it in human eyes. I am Dr. John Davis Akara. Glaucoma Consultant, I used 3D computer-aided design and 3D printing to design and print the glaucoma valves that we are talking about. So I used a free software called FreeCAD to the design of the valve which I had in mind. And once I had drawn the design and finalized it, took it to our 3D printing lamp in campus and used the resin 3D printer to print the model. I used the tube from a venflon make the tube of the valve. It was inserted into the hole of the foot plate. And uh, so this is the foot plate. And that is a tube that is inserted into the anterior chamber or pass plate. We also injected fluorescein dye through the tube to see the flow of aqueous into the valve. See the air bubble which block the canals first. So even a single air bubble can prevent proper drainage we then fixed a go tie in a plastic container and uh, did a conjunctival peritomy. The foot plate of the GTD is carefully inserted under the conjunctiva. Make sure that the conjunctival opening is big enough to accommodate the foot plate. The foot plate has a larger surface area than the cornea. The tube is left pointing upwards towards the cornea. The foot plate is then anchored to the sclera by suturing through the holes. The tube is then measured and trimmed with the scissors in a bevel shape. We have to make a track using a needle, partial thickness through the sclera into the anterior chamber in case of a fakie chi and into pars plana in case of a pseudo fakie or a fakie chi. So now that uh, partial thickness cut tunnel has been completed, then next step is to insert the tube into the tunnel so that it reaches the anterior chamber. Once the tube is inside, we have to make sure that it does not test the endothelium. These are some of the other glaucoma drainage devices that we had printed compared to the first one which was quite big. We 3D printed three different shapes and sizes of non-valve GTDs. Hope this innovation with 3D printing inspires young surgeons to start doing glaucoma valve surgeries and also to design newer models of glaucoma drainage devices. Thank you. I would also like to add that after this, we wanted to implant uh, an RD. Uh, so I have designed an RD valve and uh, th this is this is uh, this is a model of the Aurola backwards drainage implant, which I 3D printed and uh, tested in a go tie before I could actually do the uh, RD implants. So this is the 3D modeling software. These are some of the other files, and I'm uploading these designs free on uh, the 3D printing websites. Thingiverse.com is one of these websites. There's also the NIH 3D print exchange. I'm uploading these designs there. So if anybody else wants to download 3D print and use these devices, you can go to this website, download it. You can just search on Google for 3D printing shop nearby. You will find loads. Nowadays, all engineering colleges have it and there are many shops which print. You can just take the file to them or just ask them to download it, print it and give you a few copies. And this is what they look like. This is a resin 3D print. This allows higher resolution. The other one which I showed is a filament plastic 3D print. So this is the uses of uh, different types of 3D printing. This is free open source. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.
could you bring the mic a little closer dr sujatha yeah i just uh, wanted you know the, 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 the implant that you're using uh, for the uh, the 3d printed implant does it have the same feel as uh, uh, the original implant or it is more flexible or uh, more rigid uh, so um it is actually a little more um, rigid than the rd implant so we use an rd after that uh, it's a little more rigid but there are different types of materials which you can use i use a material which was freely available in our uh, medical i was in the sri ramchandra medical college so i use a material which was easily available there so practically it is free for me but if you can buy the material you can get flexible material also flexible material is available So this is resin. If you want a flexible material, I think you have to ask for TPU. TPU is one of the flexible materials which you can use. So uh, you can just ask them to print it in a flexible material. And how do you fix the tube into this uh, resin button which you have the foot plate which you have made? How I just it? inserted it. I made the size so that it directly fits into in a conical shape. So if you push it inside it just fits. you can change the design to make it lock and one more thing this is not for human use this is just for wet lab use because this is not biocompatible tested or anything this is for wet lab practice also if anybody has some other ideas for a novel design of a glaucoma drainage implant this is how you go about it design it first think about it draw it then design it in 3d then print it test it then again go back to the drawing board and change so this is how you design a new glaucoma implant or any other device you should have put no, it as a sorry sorry go ahead and no, i just had a cornea person i just wondered whether we can do something very similar like making a dmac implant so that you get the feel of it before you start actually absolutely ma'am so i i am drawing that also i am drawing that i'll upload it to my website so you can download it from uh, my uh, page on thingiverse or also on the nih uh, 3d print exchange national institute of health 3d print exchange you can download it print it use it in the wet lab yeah, yeah. thank you i also yeah. have some cts ctr and other devices so if you want to if somebody wants to practice using a ctr or a cts you can just download these things and use it in the wet lab for practice uh, i have a question here uh, it's a novel system can it be reciprocated to a orbital implant also because uh, they charge a handsome amount for a 3d printed absolutely implant. sir so, so this is uh, they they charge for the designing they charge for the uh, the printing also Correct. so if you want to print in metal you will have to get to a metal 3d printer which is available in several places in fact several dental colleges have metal printers and they are using them also savita dental college has metal 3d printers i went there and i saw that and uh, several other places also have it so if you design it yourself using this 3d software you can send it to them they'll print it and give you if you go through the middleman they will charge for every step good thank you uh, dr john uh, please take your certificate from uh, dr anand and dr sujatha please thank you sir next presenter is dr prithvi chandrakant dr prithvi av team there is camera gun Eight second, eight second. We'll just take one. Darcha, Darcha, you have to also, please. Yeah, take the certificate. <laughs> Everybody must be knowing John has a lot of things on his up his sleeve from DSLR cameras to everything. It's a phenomenal thing. That incidentally is also an ophthalmologist. We are we are blessed. You know, it's like Steve Charles being an engineer and doing the rest of the stuff and doing getting his vitrectomy. John, we are all proud of you. I must tell you that. Uh, 
patient with a cocktail of antibiotics listening to the whole cumbersome process don't you think it's lengthy and tedious hence the procedure especially in clinics like vision centers and phcs where a microbiology laboratory is not always available this process becomes difficult and the treatment delayed and that is where we need a point of care testing where it can be portable lower cost have faster processing time and also reduce the sample volume that's when we found iol scope an intraocular lens based microscope a perfect innovation tool made with minimal resources for point of care diagnosis especially for cases like corneal ulcer in this video you could see how an iol scope is made using four intraocular lenses of 30 diopter lens attached to a chart paper with liquid adhesive and then attached to a smartphone to carry out examinations of microorganisms thought why not make iol scope specific to an ophthalmologist by attaching it to a slit lamp with a mobile adapter also using a torch for illumination so introducing you to slip as you can see in the video the illumination part of the slit lamp is detached from the pivot joint and the smartphone adapter is attached to it once it fixes properly we need to reattach the illumination part into the slit lamp and this is the part of the adapter where the smartphone will be fixed and here you can see how the joystick can be used to move up and down and sideways you can use a torch for illumination or we can even make your own illumination tube with any hand sanitizer bottle and a smartphone with a flashlight on and once you keep the slide on top of this bottle you can examine it with a slip this video shows the application of slim in a patient with corneal fungal ulcer the doctor can be seen doing on spot diagnosis of the corneal scraping using the smartphone based iol scope and accordingly giving the appropriate treatment which results in better patient counseling faster treatment and prevents delay of diagnosis it is not always necessary to dismantle the illumination part pivot joint has a extension it can be simply attached to that extension and the examination carried out hence slim an attachment of the iol scope to the slit lamp bio microscope is an innovative novel modification to an existing slit lamp transforming it into a microscope Hello everyone. I'll be talking about Thank you. Uh I have a question. Your uh, yes. UI seems to be quite good and innovative, but you mm -hmm. have not shown any of the pictures of micro uh, organism oh, yeah. how it appears on your device like yeah, uh, fungus and bacteria. Uh, so at least it should have some resolution. Okay. Uh, which is useful. Yes. So uh, we have not seen that. So. Yeah, actually, uh, the actual uh, IOL scope, which uh, was done previously, uh, we have already. Sorry, uh, we have already taken pictures, and we have also published uh, published the pictures which we have taken from IOL scope, and that is exactly why I didn't put it. We were more concentrating on the slim part, on how the attachment is, and we have even uh, done a study. uh of how uh, sensitive this is uh, almost around 92 percentage of uh, kh mount we were able to diagnose with fungus and if it's a cultured uh, medium uh, we have uh, got 100 100% sensitivity on uh, getting the high fe uh, we also published two other uh, three other articles uh, on the same things of uh, how iol scope is uh, used to diagnose fungal high fe and parasites also so no sir uh unless and until there are some artifacts coming in those uh, iols uh, we can actually use it uh, numerous times
I have been using uh, one uh, this the the IOL which I used over here had four IOLs together, but uh, with Orolab we have been able to get a uh, one single IOL with 120 diopters uh, power, so that has been I have been using it for one one and a half years. Uh, has, yes. Yeah, yeah. Unless and un until the optics gets you know yeah. bad, uh, we can actually use it for a long time. Yeah. So you can't uh, change the number of IULs, like you have used four, you can use one, two, three, depending yeah, on the yeah. power. Yeah, actually the uh, the one IUL uh, uses, uh, we, we actually use the one IUL thing uh, with the 20 diopter lens for anti-segment photography. And uh, subsequently I started adding uh, more IULs of the same power and that is when IUL scope was made. So that has a col uh, co uh, collective uh, diopters of 120 diopters. And then uh, we designed a new IOL, which is uh, has this collective 120 adapters into one IOL. And we are using using that. So we it, you can, uh, depending on what magnification you want, you can actually increase the IOLs. But I've seen that uh, when we make, uh, we use anything more than four IOLs, the distance between the uh, sample and the lens becomes too small. So it was almost touching the sample. So that wouldn't be, uh, uh, easy to you know take photos but for how much how much is the gap you keep between the successive IOLs? they're not, uh, yeah, no, no, not touching each other there's a gap between no they're not touching each other almost like three millimeters uh, for this uh, for this uh, four diopters with 30 diopter lens uh, four uh, four 30 diopter lens together had uh, almost just two to three millimeters gap between the sample between each lens no no between each. Between no, no. The, uh, the, the, the sample, sample the sample, sample slide and this. the yeah the sample between slide and between the sample yeah between the lenses lenses are close to each yeah. other yeah. Lenses are on or uh, touching each other touching each other touching each other yeah. uh, so one they question parallel to each other yeah it would better yeah it, it uh, better to be parallel because then we always get a little bit of aberrations uh, so there is a lot of aberrations when we use four lenses together but if we make it like uh, how we have made it in one uh, this total magnification to one lens it is giving less uh, artifacts less um, uh, so, so how do you ensure they are parallel once you've glued them how do you ensure that they are parallel yeah it is uh, it was just manu manually yeah, manually manually yeah, uh, can you use ready made available lenses photographic lenses for mobile cameras like telescopic uh, lenses and all they are available ready made no uh, tele uh, tele uh, uh, not telescopic no, but other expensive. magnifier yeah, uh, lenses macro lenses are available but uh, that is uh, it 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 doesn't uh, hold good for uh, microscopy okay. yeah uh, the total optics and the principle of optics totally changes when we use that kind of lenses so, yeah one uh, last question prithvi uh, one last 90d question. lens uh, I, I don't think it would work, sir. Because, uh, again, the optics is a little different. Uh, for microscopy, it is different. Mm, maybe I am not tired because, again, we have to remove that whole sleeve, uh, remove the lens separately and, you know, keep it. I am not tired. Yes, uh, ma'am. Yes, last One question. One last question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think since there's a limitation in mounting the number of lenses you are using yes. this would largely cater to seeing fungal hyphae uh, yes. so when you have to see smaller organisms like microsporidia or something which yes, is is what you know where this would i mean yeah. hugely come in as an asset yes, i think we have a limitation, a limitation or you yeah. will have to look at a single mount higher power lens yes ma'am so you cannot point, vary yeah. the magnifications as you have on yeah. a microscope yes ma'am that's what i understand yeah. okay. uh, uh, the magnification we can change according to the By changing diopter, your, uh, but yeah, yeah, judging more uh, smaller ma microorganism is a limitation so for right high now. Phase, it's a yeah, huge asset, oh yeah. but uh, for yes. something like microsporidia, yes, then we probably it's a difficult. Uh, it's a little difficult at this yes. point. What about your interface on the iPhone? On the interface, you know? Yeah, that depends on uh, that depends on your phone. Uh, yeah. Which phone you use? I have been using a 5s, Correct. which uh, costs around six thousand at the market so the right now. Interface itself would help you magnify well. Yeah, yeah. that uh, that helps a lot actually. I have actually used a very uh, basic phone so that we can show people that it can be done with basic phones too. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank uh, you. In the interest of the time, we'll move on. Uh, we have our next speaker, uh, uh, Hirika Gosalia. Is she there? Yeah, Hirika, please start your presentation on do-it-yourself fixation target magnifix. So many uh, interesting, innovative things. You know, it's an uh, Indian jugad. What you can say, and they should all write a book called as "From From Jugad to Excellence." Yeah, and we need to uh, certificate from Dr. Vanity, please. Balla, sir. 
write a book on from jugad to excellence Dance taking stuff. all these things <laughs> <laughs> i'll okay. compile it okay uh, dr hirika yeah, please go ahead thank you good afternoon everyone i'll be playing my video as a newly joined first year resident in a reputed eye hospital i was posted in the pediatric department i observed that it was very difficult to achieve target fixation in pediatric patients especially during slit lamp examination during the covid pandemic when it was highly necessary to reduce the contact period between the doctor and the patient the target fixation made it even worse because of the lengthy examination time i later realized that it was just not for the pediatric patients but also for the older uncooperative patients the slit lamp shield used during the covid pandemic made it even more difficult that's when i came up with my problem statement of target fixation we often see that in our clinics we ask the patients to look at our ears during slit lamp examination to achieve target fixation but most patients do not comply with the instructions and make the examination difficult and lengthy the covid pandemic introduced the safe slit lamp shield for safer slit lamp examination and to avoid the transmission of the virus between the clinician and the patient This led to the innovation of Magnifix, a combination of magnet, eye, and fixation. Materials used were bar magnet, coin magnet, and a red reflector, all with a budget just under thirty-five rupees. We used the law of attraction between the bar and the coin magnet against the safe slit lamp shield to obtain a freely mobile target fixation. In this video we can see the application of magnifix for target fixation. It is helpful in old age, pediatric and uncooperative patients. It is also helpful for corneal foreign body removal and fundus examination. Attractive fridge magnets can be used for pediatric patients which make them more cooperative and interested during slit lamp examination. We can see this in the video how a pediatric child can be examined with the use of this attractive star shaped target fixator without any difficulty. This is now even used at pediatric departments of two other centers of a hospital where in target fixation is very easy and helps for better and faster slit lamp examination hence magnifix is a do it yourself cost effective quick to make and accessible solution to the important problem of target fixation Well, nice device, but uh, do you need to hold it always? No. Does it slide down? No, it doesn't slide down. Because so you were doing it when you were uh, showing in your video. You were doing it. You were just. But we want to change the side of right, it. But you need not. To no, hold no it. need, sir. It's lying on the slit lamp all the time. We only use it when we need the fixation to be obtained. Uh, so, because of the COVID uh, pandemic, the safe uh, safe slit lamp shield is a transparent shield that we are using in our hospital. Now, now there is no COVID. There no <laughs> so, <laughs> so we are still using it, sir. No, no, you don't use the shield. No, <laughs> it's still there in our hospital, sir. Uh, we are done with the questions, and we'll go on with the next. I request one, the madam, to please hand over the certificate to Dr. Hirika. very very simple and very very uh, useful doctor thank you next uh, is dr fatima who is here uh, she'll be presenting on sics tunnel stamp uh, 
the presentation uh, ev team please good morning good morning everyone stamp the tunnel for a perfect small incision cataract surgery the manual small incision cataract surgery is a boon to greater number of patients in developing countries being cost effective and a sutureless technique the major determinant of outcome in small incision cataract surgery is a sclerocorneal tunnel the key components of sclerocorneal tunnel are scleral groove side pockets and corneal entry though there are various types of incisions described the incisions that fall within cox funnel induce less astigmatism the cox funnel is bounded by two imaginary curved lines which are 3 mm apart at the limbus the frown incision described by singer in 1991 is the one that falls perfectly inside cox funnel and also provides large enough room to accommodate nucleus during the making perfect frown incision is not always easy especially for novice surgeons due to limited movement of the wrist joint in ulna side by nature so it will be useful to have a guide to make appropriate frown shaped incision similarly Appropriate side pockets are of paramount importance to convert two dimensional tunnel into a three dimensional one providing a wide opening to accommodate nucleus during delivery the beginner surgeons tend to make either two small side pockets landing in difficult delivery or two big ones which will not take part during delivery of the nucleus the third key factor corneal entry is preferably made 1 to 1.5 mm from the limbus If the entry is made more anterior it induces more astigmatism and if it is made short and posterior it does not allow side pockets to open and deliver nucleus For the benefit of novice surgeons we have brought out a novel device SICS tracer which could guide scleral groove side pocket and corneal incision thus helping them to make a perfect tunnel Here this device is being used on a goat's eye. It has prominent margins which helps to stamp the tunnel shape before starting sclerocorneal tunnel. After aligning the device to the limbus the stamp is made over the sclerocorneal junction and the corneal incision falls 1 mm from the limbus along with a margin which guides to make side pocket. Since the corneal diameter of the goat's eye is larger than that of the human the internal incision stamp in this video does not seem to reach the limbus which will not be a case in the human eye In human eye this device is being used after gas sterilization This device is a prototype further development with appropriate handle will give more ease to make stamping for human eye we plan to make a similar device in silicon material for an easier use and effective sterilization to conclude This holistic device guides all the aspects of sclerocorneal entry and helps novice surgeon to make perfect tunnel and yield superior visual outcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Nice innovation. Sir, uh, did you use this one? Uh, sir, this is in the stage of prototype. Okay. We are uh, ultimately we like to have in a silicon material in the stamp form. We tried with the help of Auro Lab in stainless steel material. The drawback was uh, on the. I mean, we were not able to see the limbus and properly align. So for the beginners, it would be difficult. And uh, the one I showed at the end was. Uh, Uh, modified that uh, scleral buccal band uh, just cut and tried so but uh, we want like a stamp like thing so that uh, uh, 
so we are still in process we are working size, fixed size it varies from nucleus i mean hard nucleus different and yeah we like to, yes uh, the uh, scleral incision is of 6 mm length okay. so probably we have to have in two different types to uh, for one for immature softer cataracts and one for harder cataracts so further innovation is required you know further innovation yeah, is required. yes sir further processing is required uh, that uh, ultimate but till now it is not been used in the uh, it's not regularly used we have tried the prototypes and uh, only myself and two other surgeons have tried the, uh, and it's not in uh, regular use right excellent innovation Thank i think you, it could be a much needed device for uh, especially the novice surgeons who struggle to make a good uh, entry port. Uh, any other questions? Uh, we'll go on the to the next one. The only thing yeah. is that yeah. uh, if you can just f for the the edges which you had marked were quite broad. If yes. if, if it can be made slightly yes, finer, it will be of greater help. Yes, sir. Otherwise, the incision could be... Yes, sir. Yeah. People may complain that it is not visible. So, ultimately, we are trying for that. It's still working with our lab. Yes. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We want to have Excellent. in two different sizes. True. Thank you, Dr. Fatima. You can please take your certificate from Dr. Subuddhi, please. Thank you, sir. Next uh, presenter is Dr. Prashant Girish. He will be presenting on screen cam. Dr. Prashant? Is he there? Prashant, Prashant is not Girish. there. I think Prashant we'll go Girish, to the next we can one. go to the next. The uh, next presenter? Yeah. Presenting in front okay. of Dr. Hari Priya. Instead of Dr. Haripriya Arvind, Dr. Seema Ramkrishnan will be presenting on modified iris fixated IL technique. And good afternoon, one and all. Uh, because of inadvertent reasons, Dr. Haripriya is unable to attend today. Uh, that is why I am presenting on her behalf. Uh, this is a presentation on retropupillary iris fixated IOLs. Uh, iris fixation, as we all know, is a corrective technique for surgical aphakia. Sorry? He asked me to wait. Uh, so retropupillary iris claw IOLs as well as iris sutured IOLs have been uh, described and uh, we, we can implement this procedure when we have intact iris integrity. Uh, and the contraindications as we all know are pigmented neovascular advanced glaucoma, low endothelial cell counts and serious iris trauma or absence. Retro suture iris fixation of a rigid intraocular lens has been described by us, published in the past in JCRS. But now we have come up with a modified iris fixation technique for foldable three-piece uh, intraocular lens with your regular uh, phaco emulsification incision of 2.8 uh, millimeter size. So three-piece lens is injected as usual, but now this time it's going to be in injected completely into the anterior chamber. And then one by one, the haptics are tucked below the pupillary plane be uh, behind the iris. Uh, so the important part to note is that when while tucking the haptics, we need to keep the optic above the iris plane. A cyclodialysis spatula helps us to guard the uh, optic from slipping behind the iris. Once the optic is above and both the haptics are beneath, the uh, haptics can actually be seen well because of the bump in the iris and then the uh, iris fixation can be done as, as is routinely done in cases of sutured iris fixation. So this is a surgical video with a 2.8 mm incision and you can see that uh, this is a surgical aphakia with a pre-op uh, large peripheral iridectomy done by the preliminary surgeon. The three-piece uh, sensor lens in this case, no, no financial uh, interest. Uh, the lens is injected into the anterior chamber. A cyclodialysis spatula in the left hand as a second instrument guards the IOL from slipping behind the pupillary plane. Uh, before injecting, it is important to constrict the pupil with pilocarpin. Now this uh, trailing haptic is also inserted into the anterior chamber. Uh, all along the cyclodialysis spatula guards the optic from slipping behind. Once the uh, IOL ins inside, we bring the trailing haptic closer to the wound, the optic haptic junction closer to the wound and with the McPherson forceps, simply the, uh, it is important to catch it near the optic haptic junction 
and slip the trailing haptic behind the iris in a uh, simple flex and disengage motion. Uh, once this is done, we need to uh, get the haptics away from the PI so that the bite in the iris can be placed through a good zone of the iris. Uh, the IOL is placed in an appropriate way uh, at, at say uh, 12 and 6 o'clock position. And then uh, the sutures are taken with 10-0 proline sutures uh, as is done with routinely with uh, iris fixation lens. So now the two, uh, with a single uh, bite through the cornea, the two arms of the proline suture are brought out through the side port incision and multiple uh, throws are taken to keep the uh, IOL stable. So this works like a sling and it's a very steady uh, sling that keeps the uh, haptic in place. The sim uh, similar thing is done on the other side to fix the uh, leading haptic. <coughs> so the bite is taken with the 10-0 proline suture uh, when the haptic is visible as a bump on the iris and then the proline, the arms of the proline suture are brought out to the opposite side port. Once the suture fixation is done, the optic is now tugged in the retropupillary plane and the IOL is centered well. The knots are tied and the surgery is over. We uh, have the similar, uh, uh, we can do it with a large incision. This is a wheel Marchesani syndrome where the full uh, microspherophagic lens is displaced into the anterior chamber. The lens is gently brought out and a complete anterior vitrectomy is uh, done. And uh, once the anterior vitrectomy is done, we need to constrict the pupil with pilocarpin. So once constricted, uh, this is a rigid PMMA lens. Now in this case, because this is a large incision, a rigid lens is similarly uh, placed inside the anterior chamber. And the lens is guarded with the use of a cyclodialysis spatula. So the suturing is done in a similar fashion as, as was shown in the previous case. I'll just skip, the, skip to the next slide. So this are, these are post-operative pictures. You can see that the IOLs are well centered and you can see the iris fixation, uh, iris fixation sutures as well. So the advantage is being it is using the anterior segment approach. There are no special equipments or IOL uh, needed. The uh, foldable IOL can be used. This three-piece lens can be used. Even we can refixate a lens which is displaced, bring it to the anterior chamber, and refixate the lens as well. So uh, in comparison with SF IOL, also there have been studies which have shown that iris fixation uh, is quite a stable procedure with even lesser complications. Uh, to conclude, iris fixation IOL is an efficient and safe technique for treatment of surgical aphakia and subluxation of IOL in patients with inadequate capsular support. Thank you. Thank you. Timer is not working. So they what do we have to give the time? Yeah. For everybody will give the fixed time and fixed yeah, marks? There, 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 there is a timer working here, here, sir. Yeah, oh. We, no. we can't see. We can't see the... Yeah. No, I think they are buzzing the bell. At the end of it, I request AV team to please uh, yeah, take care please of Please make that. sure that the timer is on, available, present on the screen also. Actually, yeah. sometimes when people are presenting with their own laptops, then timer oh, uh, gets lost. Subhashish That's the only yes. problem. Yes, Subhashish sir. Yeah. Dr. Siva, that yes. was, uh, I think, uh, Ripia's paper. Yes. Uh, you did well. Uh, I, I, but now we see <laughs> the, you know, we are not in favor of sutures. Even the sterile fixated ones are going sutureless. Yes, so absolutely. How really will this be helpful in the future? So the advantage here is basically you're using the same IOL that you have, you know, to begin with. So we have done a study uh, of 24 eyes in which eight were done at the primary sitting. So when, when there was inadequate support, the primarily we didn't have to change the lens. So that is one major advantage. And it's a an complete anterior segment approach. So with, an, uh, with a well-trained uh, anterior segment surgeon, it can be manipulated without pass plena vitrectomy or without need for any other additional support. So in case of crisis, you can obviously, you can, uh, you know, do it, do well with it. Uh, iris claw lens, again, uh, is at a, a plane which is a little anterior, just snug to the back of the iris. So issues with glaucoma are probably higher with iris claw lens, a separate lens is needed. Uh, and the other thing is the IOL power also, we can do with the same IOL power because this acts as a sling and the plane is slightly posterior. We don't even have to change the IOL power. With the same PC IOL power, we can go ahead with the same power. Okay, we are, understand that uh, without a special inventory of special lenses, yes. this is helpful. 
but uh, maybe a longer follow up is needed for that suture yes sir. in the in the cases that we have done with this particular technique out of 24 21 eyes had 612 vision over a reasonably good follow up of over about 6 to 6 months to 1 year and uh, one patient had uh, cystoid macular edema which could be probably because of surgical affecia mm -hmm. also Ten zero proline sutures, ma'am. So proline is known to degrade over time. Yeah. It's polyproline is known to so so far, uh, so far, over a period of time that we have done the uh, suture fixated IOLs, even with the rigid IOLs, our uh, uh, refixation rates or IOL drop rates as such have been uh, close to zero. We we've not had. I, there's only one patient, I think, uh, to the best of my knowledge, that probably uh, Dr. Haripya will be better to talk about it. But uh, yes, uh, the the rate of uh, you know damage or the IOL slipping has been very very low. But uh, you know, when you uh, I haven't tried it myself. But uh, uh, right. the tensile strength of ten zero nylon is good. But for intraocular use, uh, I'm not very sure. Yeah, uh, the number of turns and whether it you know uh, it kind of stays uh, without the loops uh, with tensile nylon might be a little more difficult than with proline yeah, but, uh, has been doing this for more than 10 years. yes with the rigid iols and recently she's been uh, doing it with the foldable iols as well i have a question on the technique yes uh, see you're suturing the haptic when the pupil is in the cat's eye shape because your optic is anterior yes then you're putting the optic behind now can then the pupil is going back to its circular shape. Yes, yes. So can this these forces cause some kind of a cheese wiring, and so, if that's going to happen, is there any countermeasure for that? So yes, uh, what is recommended is that when we are doing when we are taking the suture bite, it is important to take it in the mid periphery, not close to the pupillary margin, where the where the iris tissue is a little. More, when when we are stretched the area close to the there are two reasons. Uh, the area close to the pupillary margin is more stretched because of the IOL haptic. The area in the mid periphery to the periphery is a little more lax. That is one reason. And the second reason is we don't damage the sphincter, which is close to uh, that may cause problem with dilatation. Okay, so I had a suggestion sure, what, sir. what if when you're suturing you put two hooks and again make the pupil circle a little more so then your no. talks are equal on both sides yes. and then release the hooks put the optic behind so that there won't be any uh, you know misalignment of forces sure sir we'll take that point thank you thank you thank you very much sir sir i just want to ask out of the this question quiz question uh if any poster segment complication since it's a small pupil then how are you going to, is there any way so that's what to I was handle saying. it or it is important we have to find an innovative way to do a retinal surgeries in these so small So we'll have you next time presenting in the <laughs> Think Under the Apple Tree. <laughs> Thank you. We want retinal innovation. I request Anand sir and Kim sir and uh, Saman sir to please look into the innovation of how to do <laughs> retinal surgery in these small pieces. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Seema. You can please collect your certificate from Dr. Mukesh. Yeah. Next, next, Minakshi. Thank you so much. Uh, I next call upon our next speaker, Dr. Me Meenakshi Vadwani. Yeah, Dr. Meenakshi Vadwani will be presenting on an age-appropriate questionnaire in community-based uh, childhood visual, uh, visual impairment study. My talk is not being uh, like my presentation. Presentation? Dr. Uh, Meenakshi Vadwani's presentation, please. Uh, AV team, could they, whenever it finishes, please come up so that if there are any issues with the presentation, they can sort out. For giving me this opportunity to present this work on an age-appropriate visual function questionnaire in children, a useful tool. The slides are not moving. AV team, slides, please. Slides are not moving. Can one of you come here, yeah. please? Yeah. Please, please. please. Yeah. Uh, take a chair and sit here. That would, I'm sure, be more helpful. And requesting to please reset the tri timer. Yeah. With this also, it's not moving. Yeah, it's moving. Uh, reset the timer, please. OK, madam, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh, this was an age-appropriate visual function questionnaire in children, a useful tool. Okay. 
so the purpose of uh, the the study was a part of a community based study which was a childhood visual impairment study done at api center in it aims it was a part of a phd thesis study in which we determined the prevalence of uh, visual impairment in children under 16 uh, years and one of the objective was to determine an age appropriate visual function questionnaire and uh, 20000 children children were examined we took visual acuity and final 78 finally 784 children with visual acuity less than 6 by 12 unaided in any i were referred and all from these we have designed this vfq what is functional vision functional vision is a vision which is used in daily, uh, day to day task but there are a few instruments available but none of them have been uh, able to give a detailed assessment of impact of visual uh, function so for this we used two vfqs in vfq which had already these are the two already existing vfqs in vfq which had 33 questions and lvpi which had 20 questions methodology involved four steps first was uh, using the expert opinion these were the people who had the uh, expertise in public health low vision and ophthalmology they decided that the children would be divided into two age groups 5 to 9 years and 10 to 15 years and they removed from these 53 questions the questions on the basis of duplication and that were uh, difficult for the children to understand so then they dropped the questions in the from 53 to 29 in the smaller age group that is between 5 to 9 years and to 32 questions in the higher age group then with the step 2 and 3 involved zero variance it was a scientific method in which factor analysis was used it gave us few domains for these questions as well as factor loadings also and it was thought that factor loadings of more than equal to 0.59 would be considered as significant and then the last step involved cronvex alpha uh, cronvex alpha was the determination of uh, the internal minimal variability and we found that the cronvex alpha of, uh, of 0.8 and 0.9 was there both the vfqs are available finally in the age group of uh, 5 to 9 years 16 questions are available and in 10 to 15 years 27 questions are available we did a pre and post Uh, analysis using this children uh, using this questionnaire and it was a significant difference in the quality of life uh, in not in the quality of life, in the visual function in these children this has already been published in igo and uh, this is already uh, this is easily available in english and hindi and can be used freely thank you arun sir uh, any questions uh, वानती मैडम Sir, actually, previously two already questionnaires were there, but because it was not an age appropriate, like few of the questions were, which were in NVFQ, it was mainly for adults. And uh, in the LVPI, few which was for children, it had some questions which were not ap not appropriate for the children, especially in the smaller age group. So that is why we through this study we have decided that. Uh, the age of the children. Sir, uh, less than 16 years was the age of the children, and we divided between five to nine years, and for the 10 to 15 years. In five to nine years, we asked the questions. from the parents because children were not reliable and in the elder uh, bigger age group 10 to 15 years we asked the questions from uh, the children themselves and this study has already been used in a and is being under publication in jpos also in a ch in children with vkc to determine quality of vision in those children also this questionnaire has also also being used there also by one of the authors Ma'am, actually, one of like LVPI one had used rash analysis, and we use factor analysis. Rash analysis is also a very good method. It uses a, a person fit and item fit measures, but factor analysis gives us domains. So by this, we have calculated different domains, uh, like in the, the uh, for education, like the the ones which are required for children. There is one more Cardiff uh, visual acuity available for children, but that also doesn't has domains. So uh, by this questionnaire, we have decided four main domains of distance, which that uh, questions related to mobility, education, psychosocial, and uh, dis uh, distance. Ma'am, the results will tell, but yes, we are trying to tell this. Thank you, uh, thank you, <laughs> madam. I request you to please collect your certificate from Dr. Arul uh, Molivarman, sir. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Ashwini Kumar. Okay.
So he'll be presenting on uh, vision miracles. Uh, yeah. Dr. Venkat Prabhakar Gurudru is here. Yeah. And then Dr. Jatinder Bali. Dr. Jatinder Bali is here. No, no, I'm Jatinder Bhalla. HS message. Okay. Thank you so much, AIS committee, for allowing me to speak here. I am Dr. Ashwini from Mahavir Natrale Patna. I was a surgeon before, but 13 years back, I had a brain hemorrhage, making me paralyzed. So I made, went to Shankar Natrale and learned and started a treatment in Bihar, visual rehabilitation. So with my treatment, patients who can't see, where there is no hope, they can see again. So God has been helpful to help me that. I'm starting this, sir. Wonderful. Please reset the timer. Yes. Next, Kasi Hota. Sorry, yes. Next. Yeah. Next session, next slide. Okay. Just tell him, after he gets up, whenever he says next slide. Okay. What do you want to do? Take it, take it, take it. Continue now. Yes. Which one, sir? No, first one. First one. Here it is. Ah, this one. Yes. Second card, dear. Yes, just heading. So the introduction, low vision is the term used to describe significant visual impairment that cannot be corrected with glasses, contact lenses, medication, or eye surgery. Loss of it includes loss of best corrected visual acuity. Best corrected visual acuity was worse than 20 spent in the better eye. Significant visual field loss was there. Tunnel vision was there because of lack of in the periphery and legal blindness. Dis disability starts from the year. year, year uh, next. next. Uh. So maternal method, places were at Mahavir Netrale, Kankarbag, Patna, and Renu Eye Care Center, Dr. Pranam Janser Clinic, Borangat, Patna. 36 patients were examined with low vision. The period was December 2018 to April 2019. History, clinical examination, relevant, relevant lab investigation were done. We did visual equity snellage chart for distance and near vision chart, color vision with Ichihara chart and ocular movement and slit line examination, of course. Next one, please. The spatial intervention. Newer instruments like monocular and binocular telescopes were for the distance vision and for near vision and handheld magnifiers illuminated and null illuminated pocket magnifier, dome magnifier, and half eye and cutaways were used. Treatment, different kinds of magnifiers were given for visual correction and improvement. M training means patient will just make big M by moving his head so that he can see the view. Next one. The practical way, this you can see how we can make the patient see. These are different patients. Next. Now the problems identified, we can see. The retinitis pigmentation we have one patient, then Nystimers we had four, and staggered and so on. High myopia was also there, CSR was there, and myopia was also corrected. Next. So the results, there were improvement in visual equity and quality of life thereafter. Patient could read the newspapers, can do the homework, and the vision increased from PLPR to 660 in eight patients and counting fingers to 616 6 patients. Counting fingers 613 3 patients, counting fingers to 618 to 3 patients, 666 639 patients. In, there was no improvement in four patients. Most patients were satisfied. Next. So conclusion and discussion. Proper diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation helps in improving the vision as well as quality of life, the management of low vision needs with visual correction and rehabilitation, which, which may take several months of practice at home and daily life. Discussion, low vision correction is a worthwhile investment of time and resources. May God help all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini, for coming here. Uh, 
really nice of you we are in our low vision group he is one of the most prolific uh, persons who advises and gives his experience on low vision and thank you very much for coming and giving us this opportunity to listen to you wonderful subhash sir subhash sir to please uh, present the certificate Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ashwini. Why only Bihar? I think all over the country, low vision services are a much needed area of for research and innovation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, again, sir. Dr. Thank you very much. I think he requires a round lot of applause yes. for us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming all the way and inspiring and motivating all of us. Thank you. The next presenter is uh, Dr. Venkat Prabhakar Guduru. He will be presenting on ADL lens, a novel intraocular lens design to prevent negative dysphotopsy. So he is our last presenter of the day for uh, this session. Good afternoon everyone. I am going to present our ADL lens, anti-dysphotopsia intraocular lens, a novel design to prevent negative dys dysphotopsia. It has been 2000 years since the first ever cataract surgery has been done. Since then there has been a lot of evolution where we stand at trifocal lenses and high-end phaco missions. But there is this one factor which prevents cataract surgery to reach its zenith. That is negative dysphotopsia perceived as a temporal crescentric shadow. Like here where we do the best for the patients, but the patient says, I can see everything, I don't feel any pain, but there is this temporal concentric shadow, but which is bothering me a lot, for which we don't have an answer. So why does this happen? Coming to the physiology, where here we can see two rays. One ray is passing between the optic and the iris, and the second way it is refracting at the optic edge. So this shadow is perceived as a temporal concentric shadow. So here we can see uh, in normal crystalline lens, there is no space between iris and the crystalline lens. But here there is a lot of space, which is one of the reasons for the negative dysphotopsia. So to get rid of negative dysphotopsia, we have to get rid of the space. And we have to get rid of the uh, optic edge. Based on this concept, these are the other lenses available, which are very complicated to implant. And they have own issues of uh, availability and uh, uh, implant uh, cost. So our idea was to develop a new IOL design, simple in its concept and easy to implant. As the lens is implanted, the optic by default should come at the uh, capsule rexis margin, thus eliminating the gap between the iris and the uh, optic and there should not be any uh, optic edge. So this was our uh, design. This was our radial lens where you can see a central optic surrounded by 360 degrees haptic which is angulated at 120 degrees. So this is a video of implantation where you can see it's, uh, it's just regular lens where a regular cartridge is used and just like any other intraocular lens it is loaded and here we can see the implantation being made up of 25% water content hydrophilic material. It opens up slowly. And all it takes is a simple nudge and it goes into the capsular bag and it comes with two dialing holes through which we can aspirate the visco behind the intraocular lens. As you can see it just takes a simple nudge and it recenters into the capsular bag automatically. So 
so this is the post op pictures where you can see a small uh, reflex highlighting the fact that there is no gap between the iris and the intraocular lens and here you can see a 360 degrees uh, uh, depression which is nothing but the optic haptic junction uh, first question no no sir it's not done yet it's not done is an interesting one uh, this is uh, some other pictures this is the ocd picture where we can see this is the optic and this is the iris there is no gap between iris and the optic ayyo and this is the dilated pupil where we can see the optic continues as a haptic there is no optic haptic junction and there is no edge and this is another uh, picture where in the dilated pupil there is no angle closure or anything we can see the lens here and this is a beautiful image where we took this shimplug image this is the optic of the lens and we can see the posterior capsule is stretched out just like crystalline lens where the picture is very much similar to this uh, we performed a study where we selected 56 patients who, who experienced uh, negative dysphotopsia in one eye and we implanted this lens in another eye and none of the patients uh, complained of any negative dysphotopsia so to conclude this new eye well design is simple and easy to implant and till now we have been planning to replace the spectacles as intraocular lens design but uh, this is a new way we approach where we wanted to replace the crystalline lens the eliminating the dysphotopsia yes. thank you sir okay we we'll start with the questions yes, sir. number 1 pco uh, uh sujatha uh, just started PCO. yeah yeah varman sir go number 1 pco yes. what is the pco rating number 2 capsular distension can cause collection of fluid in the back and the, the whole fluid can become opalescent yes sir that's number 2 number 3 how is this different from putting in a three piece angulated lens upside down sir the first thing the pco rate is very less sir because uh, as japanese method of saying like if the anterior capsule and posterior capsule are kept separated the chance of pco is very less in all these 56 patients we had okay, only I'll one case i agree that yeah. what about capsular distension with opa opalescent fluid that's going to yeah. take to that. take care of that we have put uh, a large uh, hole. two uh, haptic hole sir so okay. none that, of the cases has that, any that hole is covered by the anterior capsule and that seals off no sir it comes it a uh, little bit of is open when you plan for a 5.5 or 5 mm vexis it comes as open um Yes. Yeah. 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 Whatever you are saying, no, no, I, yes, I, yes. I think what yes. he said was uh, he had put in the fellow eye of I patients see. who had uh, ND in the That's first thing. There are so many patients where only one eye who have negative dysphotopsia. Yeah. Basically, we want to make sure the person has experienced a negative dysphotopsia so that he can comment on the other eye whether he is having it or not. But you have not explanted it. No, 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 no. That would have been one better. What is the size of the central portion and the peripheral portion? Central is 6 mm optic, sir. Uh, and the peripheral mm -hmm. diameter comes around 11.5 mm see now the central portion is very close to the uh, capsular axis yes, yes. so that means the gap between the optic and the posterior capsule will be more yeah so the chances of pco will be more in these cases because the pco has to be snugly touching the posterior part of the optic to prevent any uh, migration of the epithelial cells so theoretically the pco rate will be much more in these kind of lenses yes sir by going by that concept pco rate should be more but pco will be more so we are preventing negative dysphotopsia which is very rare and the chances of pco will be much more which is more common actually pco is very less in our case series sir because How do anterior capsule that? and posterior capsule they are not touching each other so the no. transfer of anterior epithelial cells to posterior is also very less it will be migration of the equatorial epithelial cells to the posterior capsule so that will be much more because the gap is more and as dr arul mm. said the capsular distension syndrome will be much more theoretical in these cases yeah theoretically yes but because uh, the optic is very close to the capsular axis and it is closing that capsular opening yeah and you showed in ubm picture that there is a capsule uh, is uh, the yeah. capsular bag is very nicely very distended. much distended yes so yes. what is the thickness of the lens this thickness sir the thickness of the lens uh, lens it's uh, 1.56 sir 
thickness is 1.56 so thickness is same optic. thickness is same so how do you explain yeah. the uh, distension of the Eight. capsule because the thickness ah. of the normal lens is also one uh, around 1.5 Compared this to the crystalline lens, which, which is early post-op or, or or it is a late post-op picture. Both, sir. We have both, and uh, see, no, basically the, the haptics they land right behind the equator, sir. So it will have the stretch effect. Once it push pushes the uh, posterior capsule, the posterior capsule will uh, obtain its own original contour. That is the actual concept, sir. The haptics doesn't go and sit in the equator. They land land almost uh, maybe 0.2, 0.3 mm behind the equator. So it will nicely stretches open the posterior capsule. Uh, and what is the refractive index of these lenses? Because one, one of is, one of yeah. the theoretical explanation for negative dysphotopsia is higher refractive index of uh, acrylic hydrophobic material. That is about 1.48, 1.5. What is the refractive index of these? Uh, this is hydrophilic material only, sir. So refractive index will be less. Yes, yes. It's a regular hydrophilic, but uh, more with more water content. So. It's more friendly with the capsular bag. Ah. As it opens, the capsule will hold it. Dr. Venteprabhu, superb Venteprabhu, you had a beautiful concept yeah. and you made the lens, you put them in the human eyes and you showed us the result also. Fantastic. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. I, I have a question I, I, here. I have one last question before we finish. Yes, sir. Were all the lenses in oh. touch with the pupil margin? Yes, sir. They do touch. All fifty-seven lenses in touch with the pupil margin. Yeah, they do touch, but uh, there is no pigment dispersion or anything. So that's why you chose the uh, hydrophilic. Won't it be simpler to put a secondary piggyback eye oil in a symptomatic patient rather than uh, put it as a, as, a, as a prophylactic? Sir, uh, our idea surgery. was to eliminate this problem, sir, completely. We just want to move ahead of this negative dysphotopsia. Thanks, doctor. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I yeah. have a one, question. Yeah, I one last I question yeah, from Mukesh, sir. I have a question here. Yes. Have you taken approval from your institutional ethics committee or uh, because there will be too many things in this kind of IOL. Mm -hmm. You will be tenting up iris. Your IOL is not going up to the equator. There will be long-term issues about glaucoma in these cases along with the other uh, issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also the problem of negative dysphotopsia is there in initial one year only. Beyond that, I, uh, I think it's hardly so there. So patients get used to it, sir. <laughs> Whatever it is, but yeah. you don't get patients of negative dysphotopsia after one year. So to counter a problem which is temporary, we are doing something permanent in the eye which is not approved and which can have uh, severe implications. So I think... Uh, no, the process was uh, proper, sir. We took the ethical committee and everything. We made okay. sure there are no, none of the patients had any complications. No flare, no cells. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, you can collect your certificate uh, from Dr. The Dryer. It's on yes, dot 225 and, and we conclude this session. Thank on you very time. much. Thank you very much for the expert panel and the judges. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for being a part of this yeah, program. Being a part of this Thank Looking you. Looking forward for Thank more you. and more participation with ARC. Thank you very much. One line for